Hi, good morning. Uh, my goal today is to give you sort of a smattering or an overview of some of the legal ramifications of uh, participating in federal research and development programs. And um, my experience is sort of spans not only uh, sort of the uh, STTR, SBIR, uh, but a, a lot of different agencies. So I'm going to give you sort of a broad overview and uh, some of the thought processes you might want to go through to make sure, like, is this for me? And uh, what am I getting into in terms of that? Um, I will observe that oftentimes a VC looking at some of the terms and conditions in a typical government R&D situation will pause and have some consternation about certain clauses, not realizing that on, while on their face they seem threatening to an investment, they really either have never been implemented or they don't really pose a real threat. So sometimes you can, um, you can look at these things and get a little bit overly worked up. And so my, my hope is to give you sort of a general uh, sense of things. Um, in terms of the overall concept of federal dollars in, in R&D, it's really a sort of a, a, a bargain, a, a, a public contract between you and the federal government, and each side is getting something out of it. And in general, with regard to uh, the federal government, as we heard, there are some public interests that sometimes are either underserved or that need to be advanced, such as uh, augmentation of defense, uh, public health, food and energy supply, national security, uh, support for, um, that, that is the primary driver and oftentimes that's the deliverable subject matter where they, this is what they want. Uh, there is also an underlying um, goal of, most, of almost all federal R&D which is uh, to support U.S. technical su supremacy and um, in a manner that doesn't violate some of the World Trade Organization uh, uh, agreements that we have. In other words, uh, some agents, some governments can sort of put on illegal subsidies to, to have their national companies compete in the marketplace. And so we, we try to balance that uh, to make sure that we are abiding by uh, our WTO obligations, but at the same time making sure that our companies are sort of advancing and the technology stays at the forefront of things. Uh, underlying all of this is the creation of U.S. jobs, uh, really. There's a, there's a big theme here in almost all instances where uh, there's very much of a desire to, um, uh, to augment industry and our either industrial base or uh, uh, our capabilities of delivering responses to threats. Uh, there are also balance of trade considerations where if our companies have te technologically advanced uh, systems that, you know, our, our sales abroad would be augmented. And then, of course, the particular applications where maybe the government needs something, uh, in most instances, like, for example, National Science Foundation, that would not be the case. But many agencies are seeking a particular thing that they want to accomplish. And uh, so that's the federal bargain side of things. And then as far as the private contractor or awardee or grantee, uh, uh, the way that it, most federal R&D programs are structured is uh, you actually get to own the IP that you create uh, with the assistance of the federal government. You can elect title to inventions that are created, uh, uh, which are called subject inventions, by the way, and I'll get into what that means in a moment. Um, you get to take your existing technology and actually get funding or uh, facility assistance or some other kind of aid from the government in terms of moving it along, advancing it, and uh, without diluting the equity in your company. Uh, you get to support your scientific staffing and cover your overhead uh, between chargeable projects. Uh, you also get performance experience and can begin building uh, some uh, past performance record that'll give you opportunities for further government work, you know, all while you're keeping the lights on and um, uh, advancing your company's interests. So how does it, how does it, uh, how is it structured? I'll just give you a very brief sort of history uh, in, about World War II on to around 1980. Uh, the general rule was the government owned anything they funded. In other words, the patent ownership provisions uh, would vest the ownership in the government, and that was a public patent. Anyone could use it. And as a result, VC monies just sort of said, well, if anyone can use that, 
why am I going to pour uh, my investment in here to try and bring this technology up when the next guy down the street, because it's a public patent, he can practice it too, and I'm going to be undercut and I'll lose my investment, so no, I'm not going to do anything. So a number of studies uh, came out in the 60s and in the 70s, and it took uh, Congress a little while to warm up to the idea that that's not a good model. You need to leave title with the contractors who are best able to try and commercialize something and to kind of uh, let the government have a fully uh, adequate license right so that it can uh, do what it wants with the technology when it needs, but really let the government uh, the contractors have the commercial marketplace to themselves. In other words, that they would be able to commercially exploit what, was, uh, what they learned and what they developed in the context of the procurement program. So uh, there are elaborate uh, regulatory schemes that are set up. You know, I, because I flew here, I didn't carry my books with me, but I mean, there is a federal acquisition regulation which is in about six point, you know, type that's probably that thick, single spaced, and another one just for the Defense Department, which is a supplement to the first book, uh, just dealing with the DOD regs. And so uh, you've heard references to FAR, and, and I, I just mentioned the DFARs. Th those very elaborate, very like, uh, 20, 30 years of procurement learning baked into those books, largely focused on the procurement uh, co and, and contract uh, arena. And, but there are, uh, there are similar concepts that are reflected in lots of different other types of agreements. One of the other ones you've heard was an other transaction, which is uh, sort of a more flexible instrument where you don't have to abide by a lot of the, it's more negotiable. And so that's sort of a, an expanded authority that many agencies have been granted. Um, but then we have, you know, cooperative research and development agreements where there's really no funds exchanged. It's just each party comes to the table and is uh, either cost sharing or in-kind contribution sharing in some fashion or another to accomplish a goal. Uh, there are cooperative agreements such as Tyler just mentioned and uh, grants. Um, and so there's a, a work for other agreements. There's a whole array of types of government R&D agreements. Some of the concepts I'm talking about are going to be applicable to many uh, and or most of them, but also not to all of them. So just to be mindful of that. Uh, in terms of uh, allocation of rights, uh, how does it work? Well, the, the, the general outline is that the government retains a non-exclusive, irrevocable, fully paid up license to practice any subject invention and, or, or have it practiced on its behalf uh, throughout the world. And in other words, that's the license right the government retains. And they get unlimited rights in data that they've called for as deliverable and or software that they've asked to have developed. Um, they also retain certain what are called march-in rights. And uh, this is bolded in here largely because it's overemphasized, I think, with regard to uh, VC concerns. Marchin Rights says that if you, in the end, don't really commercialize the technology, you're not making a commercial go of it, you're not attempting to kind of create jobs, cre stimulate commerce, et cetera, the government come in, can come in and say, we're gonna, we want you to license some others in different fields of use, or we want to replace you. And uh, while that sounds very scary to people who may uh, make an investment in a company, uh, the government has never really exercised those. They've threatened a couple of times, like during the AIDS crisis, when protease inhibitors and such, the pricing on them was so expensive, they rattled the sword that um, you know, we were going to exercise those. But what happened is some you know, things got adjusted, and, and that never has happened, really, other than just a couple of, just a few times of threat over you know, a 20-year period. By the way, um, this, this is all in what's called the Bayh-Dole Act, as many of you may be familiar with that term. My own view of that statute is it's probably one of the best examples of bipartisan cooperation and one of the most successful statutes I've, I've seen in my uh, time in practice uh, where it really has changed pretty much everything in the way that uh, government did business with IP and, uh, and R&D. Um, and so here are the three categories. Uh, on march in rights. And, and while I did say they've never been exercised, the one thing I will uh, mention is, you know, there have been some recent um, examples with regard to the EpiPen and the markup of 7,000% on another drug uh, where people started making noise on Capitol Hill again about like, well, maybe we need to be more aggressive about this. Maybe we need to kind of commandeer some of these things. And so those instances, tend to come and go and flare things up, but uh, at the moment I don't anticipate 
any change. So the good news in terms of non-dilutive funding is the Fed tech dollars, you can research a new technology, advance it. Uh, you get title to IP, it vests in your company. Uh, there are certain things you have to do. Um, there's no repayment or recoupment obligation uh, if you are commercially successful and there's no equity stake in your company. Now, with regard to recoupment, I'll mention that similarly, there have been times on Capitol Hill where that has been an issue. In the original CRADA statute, for example, they wanted to bake in a, a notion that, okay, if you, are, if you got a product and you're commercially successful, we want you to pay the government back, the government's portion of the investment at least, and maybe even share in revenues. And that was debated back and forth and it was left out of the statute. And so the way that it was structured did not provide for that. And, and the reason I cite Taxol in here as a you know, chemo agent is that was wildly successful. It was a, a product that was developed from the bark of uh, Pacific Northwest yew trees and uh, as an agent in chemotherapy was very successful for what was it called at the time SmithKline Beecham. And uh, you know, they were making, I think, something like $500 million a year off of that drug. And Congress got itself all in a knot and held hearings and was all kinds of hoopla over like, how is it they're making so much money and we had a hand in creating that and we're not getting anything. And it really, the answer was after about six months of skirmishes, uh, because that's how you set it up. <laughs> you know, it's sort of, uh, so sort of Congress beat itself up and then kind of it faded into the background. But um, it's a good example of how you can, if you do have something that's hit, you know, hit it out of the park, you, you can make a substantial amount of revenue off of something that was in part uh, funded with, uh, with government dollars. And so um, what are the strategic considerations if you're thinking about, do I want federal money or not? And it depends a little bit on what you're making. For example, uh, if you are making uh, tanks or uh, missiles and you're thinking about taking uh, Department of Defense Research and Development dollars, when you consider the license rights that the DOD would get, the you know, fully paid up license rights to any inventions, you could try and patent that technology and you could think, okay, this is great, I'm getting paid, I'm gonna own this patent. But when your only customer is the government, the DOD, and you're not allowed by uh, technology export regs or national security classifications to sell it anywhere else, you know, then your only customer is the one who now can take that bundle of rights and have it made by others on, it for, on its behalf. And in other words, it can just compete it, you know, and say, who can make this thing for me the cheapest? And it's not, it's not necessarily going to be you. So if that's your model and that's your only customer, you're probably better off going for VC funding and owning the title to whatever it is you create entirely, licensing that to the government, having them come back as a repeat customer. Now, in the drug in development environment, it's a different question because, you know, even the sophisticated agencies, the NIHs of the world, uh, you know, they're not really in the business of manufacturing drugs. They may have a license uh, to use your patents and that sort of thing. But in terms of the actual sales in the marketplace, that is a very appreciable model that, that's worth considering. And so the, that's part of the strategic considerations uh, that, uh, you know, it depends on which agency and what you're doing. And, um, and then if there are not commercial, uh, there is no commercial market or it's such a small market, I think Tyler sort of alluded to something earlier where sometimes the government realizes, you know what, no one's gonna do this because it's just not big enough. So we, the government, have to fund it. And so in that instance, it's sort of like bring this into being, we need it, even though there may not be a huge upside to you, you will get paid in the, in the, in the interim. So um, I think we've covered these materials. Uh, in terms of what obligations are you signing up for, there are some things you need to be mindful of. And uh, you know, like I said, margin rights is overemphasized. Some of these are underemphasized in my opinion. So um, accounting is not one of the underemphasized. I think most people recognize the government has a whole series of accounting regulations and guidance. Uh, NIH has guidance, OMB has guidance. There are large cost accounting standards that uh, DOD and others follow with, in procurement contexts. And so uh, the way the government sort of recognizes, even in a cost share environment, like are you spending what you say you're spending? Or you know, are, are you using the monies that we're giving you for what you said you would? Uh, you know, they recognize like sort of what, what are called allowable costs 
and, un and, uh, and then don't recognize unallowable costs and there are rules associated with defining those. And then are they indirect, uh, you know, facilities administration costs or are they direct costs chargeable to a contract? And, and that's sort of the, those are the definitions they use. And then there, like I said, there are a series of uh, other rules. There's some compensation caps. Um, and then some audit rights that you're signing up for where the government, you're basically saying, yeah, you can come in, take a look at my books, make sure I'm spending it the way I said. And um, the, any of the FAR sites you'll see on these slides are, um, you know, for contracts and procurement. Uh, some of the other uh, guidance uh, for OMB's uniform guidance, subpart F, uh, for example, is, uh, is more generally applicable. Um, and again, so um, when, you're, when you're thinking about this, one of the things you want to think about is, do I have a system in place that would be adequate to meet these requirements? Am I going to be out of compliance the moment I sign the contract? Or do I have something that I, that I uh, you know, will meet uh, NIH grants policy uh, statement or part <coughs> a party of uh, the uniform guidance from OMB? And, um, while that may be somewhat of a daunting uh, thought for a small company, like, God, how am I going to learn all this? The good news is um, there are lots and lots of vendors and providers, law firms, uh, who, you know, can tell you yes, no, maybe, uh, and kind of walk you through that relatively inexpensively and relatively easily because it's just something that, once you know it, it's sort of not as complicated as the morass of pages initially suggests that it might be. Uh, and I'll just mention also, it also depends a little bit on what type of organization you are. There are some other parameters for nonprofits and universities and, and uh, commercial organizations. Um, so there are also some, uh, what I saw, underappreciated intellectual property compliance issues. Um, we talked about subject inventions before, and a, a couple of things I'll mention about those. Uh, one is, um, a subject invention is something that is either conceived or first actually reduced to practice during uh, the performance of this grant or award. And obviously conception is easy to know. You know, you say, okay, I came up with this idea when I was doing it, or I actually had that idea beforehand. That, that's a clear dividing line. What most people get tripped up on, though, is the first actually reduced to practice. So you have a concept. Uh, and there's many contractors or grantees who think, you know what, I'm going to outsmart the system and the way I'm going to do it is I have my concept, I'm going to, like the day before I sign the federal contract or grant, I am going to file a provisional patent application on this idea. And that is a constructive reduction to practice under patent law. Well, that's true in the commercial world of patent law. But in my world, which is the sort of the federal R&D area, uh, that's not true because the, the filing of that provisional application, if the thing has never been made and you're using the federal dollars to bring it into being for the first time, that is a first actual reduction to practice. The rules concerning constructive reduction that's applicable in patent litigation commercially don't apply and you, are, you will have a subject invention created under the program in which the government will have those license rights we, we talked about. So um, the... Um, other minor obligations is if you do have a subject invention, you, you have certain obligations to report it to the government. And there are now electronic, like iEdison and other systems for um, notifying the government, providing easy kind of reporting, usually from uh, 60 days from when the person in your organization who handles patents is aware of this thing. You're supposed to kind of tell them, hey, I think we got one. Um, why is that important? Uh, well, it starts the clock ticking on other obligations, like you, you're title ownership is usually derived from an actual election of title. So you, have, you actually affirmatively make, hey, you know that invention I reported to you? I, I'm going to elect title to it. And then, and then there's also an obligation to file a patent application within a certain period of time after that. All of that seems very innocuous. Uh, and it is. And it's real easy. And it's not, um, it's not very, very draconian. But there are some things that can happen if you aren't in compliance or you don't have somebody kind of looking over the shoulder making sure this stuff gets done. And I'll tell you what those are. Um, 
Okay, one other obligation I didn't mention, which is you have to insert in the early paragraphs of your specification of your patent application a statement of government sponsorship, which identifies the contractor grant number and the agency involved, so that if anybody wants to go back and find out what are the government's rights, they can go and find that thing and, and look at it and figure it out. Uh, and then post-filing, there are some utilization of the invention reports that goes back sort of to the um, it, partly to the march in question, but mostly because the government likes to be able to look at metrics and say, okay, yeah, we've had this many successes. This stuff is out there in the marketplace. It's, it's making its way out there. Uh, it's not just sitting on a shelf anymore. So if you fail to report a subject invention, you fail to elect title in a timely fashion, you actually can trigger some um, remedies that are unfavorable, such as the government can then claim title to the patent. So in other words, you may think, yeah, I filed it. It's got my inventor's names on it. I didn't put the government rights statement in there. Uh, I, you know, that was like an oversight, and I didn't give timely notice, et cetera. But you can get into a situation where the government says, you know what? Yeah, you, you kind of disadvantaged us, and we are going to claim title to the patent now. And, and one of the worst consequences of that is oftentimes is now that we own title, you, you no longer have a license right to practice the invention you created. So where does that leave your company? Mm, rather a shocking sort of notion, rarely applied. Uh, this case, Campbell Plastics, is probably a rather dramatic uh, example of, uh, of how that happened, where um, the contractor actually did mention the invention in uh, deliverables, and there were paperwork back and forth. Um, but <clears throat> really, um, it was supposed to be submitted on a particular form. They didn't use it. And uh, the net consequence was that is, after years of involvement and investment in that area, they lost title to that patent. They lost their license right to practice that invention. And uh, so the takeaway is it's important to have somebody in-house or to have somebody kind of watching from outside just to make sure things are going and you're just checking those boxes and doing it, because that's a rather uh, dramatic uh, result. Now, before I frighten you too much with that, I will say this. Um, most of the time that doesn't happen, even when there's been a mistake um, or an oversight, because it's usually a situation where the government felt like it was being gamed or that it was taken advantage of and that somebody's playing fast and loose with the rules when that kind of draconian re remedy is exercised. I've seen instances where you know, I'm doing some due diligence either on a manufacturing waiver or something else, and I'm looking at a patent family, I'm like, what about these CIPs and these divisionals? Like, they don't seem to be in I Edison, and well, you know, and, and a lot of times what happens is, you know, it's just sort of like a, well, we did the initial report, and we thought that covered everything, or whatever, just, it was really just sort of a clerical error. And most agencies, you know, when you discover that and you go to them and say, hey, by the way, we should have told you this and this and this, and here, we'll upload these, and, and they're more or less, okay, no harm, no foul. And so most of the time, that's how it works. But in, in instances where they think that you're taking advantage, um, they have some rather powerful tools to remedy that. So it's just something to be mindful of. So other things to be mindful of, uh, socioeconomic uh, policies. The government has a myriad, in fact, you know, the government is the largest customer in the world of everything from pencils to tanks. Um, it has its, used its procurement muscle to try and steer social policy through decades. And, and a lot of times, you know, it, it comes in lots of different flavors and it happens sometimes in knee-jerk response to sort of congressional legislation in response to something that happens along the way, uh, you know. And uh, so there's a large number of contract clauses, grant provisions, and other things that are trying to kind of modulate behavior. And, and um, uh, many of them are keyed to threshold dollar spending. So if you're, you're below a certain threshold, they don't apply to you. Uh, all of that is, in general, charted out uh, by and is easily analyzed once you kind of know what your documents uh, say and what they have in it. Um, and so I'll give you just a f some examples and flavors. So most of the FAR sites, again, are for contracts. This is not necessarily applicable to grants, but uh, they are reflected, the concepts are often reflected in other provisions that are applicable. 
So it's things like uh, affirmative action, you know, they want you to have an affirmative action plan, uh, or uh, to, you know, if, if there are lists of certain things, so, uh, but if the government is uh, buying services or supplies on the list, they prefer that you buy them through uh, the certain agencies that uh, have, have approved uh, vendors for the blind or severely disabled people, so in other words, encourage them to be productive members of society. And then there's things like anti-kickbacks, you know, they want to kind of formally say that, you know, we'll have none of that. Um, and then preferences to buy American, uh, to, to uh, more or less keep it within the shores if you're going to be buying certain things for use in the United States. Uh, wage and hours, um, various materials, uh, use of convict labor as, as a rehabilitation process, uh, covenants against contingent fees, um, and drug-free workplaces, uh, and then environmental compliance, um, equal opportunity, and um, lots of small business set-aside programs. Um, so um, a lot of these, you know, uh, and the no gratuities, um, and uh, no federal officials to benefit from your participation, uh, and uh, sick leave, things along those lines. Uh, there's one or two, I'm trying to think, uh, where is it? Uh, I had an asterisk or so I thought. Uh, there are a couple uh, that recently were, uh, there was an injunction that was issued against a new policy dealing with um, uh, some, um, uh, socioeconomic compliance issues, and so um, let me see if I can uh, to get more specific on that. Bear with me just a second. Me, uh, yeah, fair pay and safe workplace. Um, in October, the Eastern District of Texas issued a nationwide preliminary injunction against some of those policies, but there are still uh, wage statements and such in terms of informing the government of what you're paying people that are still required to be submitted effective January 20, January 1 of this year, 2017. So that gives you a, a sense of like lots of different socioeconomic policies are reflected in some of your obligations, and it's just a good idea to uh, to check to see what they are and what they mean and whether they apply to you. What happens if you can't uh, comply with those? You can, you can be audited um, by the uh, Federal Contract Compliance uh, Programs uh, Office. You can get a corrective action plan. You could have your agreement terminated. You could get a negative past performance evaluation, which would impact your ability to get future work. And for flagrant violations, such as, as you know, kickbacks and things along those lines, you can get suspended and debarred from ever doing business with the government for a period of a number of years, not only your company, but oftentimes personnel in your company. And uh, so um, the other thing is inaccurate certifications that you're in compliance can be false statements under criminal civil penalty rules. And um, the... Um, uh, and the submission of false invoices can be false uh, claims, which are uh, subject to uh, like a $21,563 per occurrence uh, penalty. And that would be each invoice over a long contract. That could be a lot of invoices multiplied by $21,000. Those numbers add up pretty quickly. So my, it's a long way of saying it sounds scary, but really it doesn't take much to just kind of be in order. and. Uh, but the, this is sort of your motivation to be in order in terms of these issues. And then lastly, as we talked about um, U.S. manufacturing preferences, most grants, contracts, et cetera, do say that, uh, you know, if you're going to make something, um, you know, uh, or if you're going to license somebody else exclusively to make it, uh, we want you to get them to agree, and we want you to agree, that you're going to make every effort to make it here in the United States. It's not an absolute rule, uh, it's flexible. There are, uh, almost all agencies have waiver guidelines and such. NIH has uh, very detailed and easy to fill out electronic forms for this. Um, and uh, the reason is you, you need to at least be able to demonstrate, hey, I tried to get like, people to agree to this, but for various economic reasons, it's just not possible. Or in instances like, you know, hey, you know, we have a $20 million plant that we 
you know, we have an option to buy in this country, but we can't move it. And, you know, we want to make stuff there and import it to the United States and sell it. Uh, so, you know, there's lots of uh, things that, um, reasons why, you know, it should be okay for the agency to kind of look at and say, yeah, in that instance, fine. But it is um, sort of a, a motivation uh, to do that. The risk is if you make the financial commitment to make it somewhere else and then you remember, like, oh yeah, I had to get a waiver for that. Maybe I'll go ask now. It's like that's your, your money's at risk in that instance. So, um, and uh, so in conclusion, you know, Fed tech programs offer a great opportunity to advance both the public good and your company's position in offering uh, technologies to meet commercial needs. Risks can be managed without much difficulty. Compliance plans and programs are readily available, and vendors are uh, a plenty to help you out through those. And uh, a little front-end legal assistance can go a long way in, in helping you avoid some of the more uh, frightening scenarios. So thanks. I uh, hope that gave you a, a sense of things. So. Does anyone have any questions? Yes, sir. You mentioned audits and the separate market. We have TCA looking at um, uh, incurred current costs from 2012. We don't even have it on this contract right now. So I'm interested in your comments and more generally about um, some of these obligations you'll take on as a contractor that may live well beyond the life of the contract itself. It becomes much more difficult to stay on top of those answers. You know, With the agency, yeah, yeah. For those of you who may not heard the question, he said, uh, uh, sometimes there are audits that are kind of looking backwards in time, well after a program has ended, where the relationship with the agency is over. And you know, uh, he just wanted me to comment on, you know, how do you sort of stay on top of those? And I guess the general rule is, in your agreements, oftentimes you'll see like a three-year a clause that says after closeout of the contract, for another, for, for another. The government forever to close out contract. Right. Right. That's the rub. That's not when you completed the work. That's when you right. Yeah. When the contract is officially closed. And so, yeah, when you get your DD-250 or whatever it is, depending on the agency, the, um, I think the systems, there are, like, for example, computer systems that people use in contract management to sort of say, okay, last deliverable was made. At six month mark, we want to request. At the eight month mark, we want to request close out. You know, kind of want to, we want to stay on that and send reminders and kind of then start the clock ticking on the, the three year audit window after close out. You know, so it is, there are lingering, I guess the bottom line is the, uh, there are lingering obligations that if they want to come back and audit, and the government can be sometimes slow in doing so, that they, they can. I was curious to remark on um, some of those obligations. Um, <laughs> you would point out that, that lived well beyond the life of the contract. So, for example, reporting on, on your uh, use of the intellectual property, you know, how long does that go? Usually, once the term of the uh, it, 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 all, it all depends on the agreement. Usually after the term of the agreement is over um, and, and the matter has been closed, usually that, that sort of the, that's sort of the end of it uh, in terms of your affirmative obligation to take steps. But uh, you you may get asked after the fact, you know, hey, give give us an update on this, you know. Uh, but there are instances like audits um, and others that do have sort of an ongoing. Uh, well, you also mentioned, for example, um, manufacturing in. U.S. US. Yeah. So that, 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 that lives on. That lives on. Yeah. Yeah. That lives on for the life of the patent. And so, if you're if you're going to be licensing somebody, you are required to flow down that obligation and to also make them agree that they will flow it down to any exclusive licensee. Um, Non-exclusive, it's less troublesome, but uh, it, or an assignee. Like for example, if you're transferring the rights to a large pharmaceutical company, they they have to assume those as well. So that's, a, that's something that carries forward as part of the funding uh, arrangement. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, Brad or Ben. I've been told that um, if you use, say, an SDIR that's incorporated in some sort of for instance, and that can make that project very unattractive to have Here you've got to make it sound like commercialization of that shouldn't be really significant. 
Yeah, I, I, my own view on it is that the VCs are way more nervous about like, well, there was federal funding involved. What does that mean? What does that mean? You know, now, if you're funding a defense project and it's very much focused, like we were talking about that analogy, yeah, well, then I would have a real heartburn over it. But in instances where the likelihood of the government actually entering into the marketplace and becoming a manufacturer and, and it is very, very, very small, there, you know, is the risk there? There's a little bit of it, but really as a practical matter, it's not gonna happen. Uh, so I would say uh, that is worried about more than is necessary. Yes, sir. So if you're funded by the government, do they have any rights in terms of pricing power? I know FSS and Medicaid No, that's the sort of tax all problem. <laughs> you know, that's Congress wanted that to, to happen when they realized, you know, tax all was so successful. But um, the in general, the commercial marketplace will set the price. And yes, it's true that Medicaid, those programs, CMS will kind of, you know, negotiate and say, no, we're not paying more than this. Um, in instances, with, in instances where the government is a purchaser of the actual drug, um, if there is a component of that pricing that is attributable to a royalty, or let's say if you know you have licensed that from somebody, or whatever, and the government has a paid-up um, royalty-free license to the patent, they will say, "I want that excluded." You know, but in general, no. It's usually the CMS negotiation is. It's kind of that those price points, or uh, in terms of what is recognizable, will, will be how it's set. Any other questions? I'll be around for a little while if uh, if you do. All right, thank you.